Good afternoon. That was good. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this wonderful celebration. I am Wanda K. Brown, president of the American Library Association. Today, we celebrate the winners of AOA's I Love My Librarian Award. Nominees who were nominated by library users for their outstanding service to their communities. These 10 honorees are inspiring examples of what's possible within our profession. Their stories are a testament to the profound leadership, compassion, and expertise of our nation's libraries and librarians. On behalf of the ALA Executive Board, library workers, and advocates nationwide, thank you, Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the New York Public Library, and the New York Times for your continued support of this important award. I would also like to acknowledge the members of this year's I Love My Librarian Selection Committee. You'll be hearing more from, from them later this afternoon. They are Lorda Garcia Febo, past president of ALA and chair of the Selection Committee. Carl Matute, deputy director, branch libraries and education at the New York Public Library. Lauren Presley, past president of the Association of College and Research Libraries. Catherine Roots Lewis, past president of the American Association of School Librarians. And Ramira Salazar, president of the Public Library Association. Thank you all for your hard work and insight. Just a few months ago, we started with a pool of nearly listen, nearly 2,000 nominations submitted by library users across the country. That was a tough job for that committee. Thanks to them for their dedication and expertise. We now have 10 exceptional winners joining us tonight. Now, please welcome Lorda Garcia Febo, immediate past president of the American Library Association and chair of I Love My Librarian Award Selection Committee. Thank you, Wanda, and thank you to everyone who has joined us here today, and to those of you that are joining the live streaming today as well. We are very excited. It has been a great honor to lead this year's selection committee, and I hear the stories of so many amazing, life-changing librarians. Over the past decade, only 120 out of the nearly 200,000 librarians in the country had been honored with the I Love My Librarian Award. Some of our past winners are here with us today. Will you please stand so we can all give you a hand? <laughs> Fantastic. And now I am thrilled to welcome our newest group of winners, all of whom have transformed lives in their libraries towns, schools, and campuses.
Their stories are powerful reminders of the many ways libraries build community, expand access, and promote inclusion for all. Our winners are educators, empowering students, and lifelong learners of all ages through access to information and instruction. From teaching classes to one-on-one -on -one mentorship, today's honorees are committed to spreading knowledge throughout their communities. Our winners are champions of inclusion, expanding access to traditionally underserved populations, including immigrants, refugees, and people with disabilities. They've worked to make their libraries spaces where people of all backgrounds feel they belong. On a personal note, advocating for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to make our world a better place is an important part of what I do in my professional life. Therefore, I want to add that personally, I am thrilled that our winners care about our environment, our planet, our oceans, and life on land, and life below water, as the United Nations classifies these. Our winners are brave, bringing programming about death and dying, and topics of interest to our communities. These librarians rock. We do, right? <laughs> to our 10 winners, your impact goes far beyond the four walls of your library. Thank you for your dedication and your passion. Now, I am delighted to introduce Karel Matut, Deputy Director of Branch Libraries and Education at the New York Public Library, as well as my colleague on the I Love My Librarian Selection Committee. The New York Public Library has been a long-standing supporter of this award, and we are happy to have them represented here today. Carol, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Twelve years ago, the I Love My Librarian Award was conceived with the generous support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Today, this award, which is also co-sponsored by the New York Public Library and the New York Times, recognizes and celebrates the dedication and commitment of librarians from across the country. I am thrilled to be here today at ALA Midwinter as we honor 10 colleagues selected from close to 2,000 nominations submitted by library users nationwide. This award is one way to celebrate ALA's core values, values that may at times seem as if they're under attack, but librarians unflinchingly uphold. Librarians and library workers leave no stone unturned in helping to provide access to information or quenching that thirst for knowledge. We will eagerly go down the rabbit hole with our patrons and help them find the answer that eluded them on the internet, the questions that challenged them in the search for understanding. You can find librarians and library workers in your neighborhood branches, schools, and in academic institutions. You can also find them conducting programs in community parks or laundromats, driving around the neighborhood in bookmobiles, distributing materials to incarcerated populations, giving books away to children separated from their families at the border, and so on. 
We create safe spaces for others to explore, understand, and access information. We help ensure that everyone sees their experiences reflected in our collections and programs. This award acknowledges the fact that librarians change lives. We support families, individuals who are incarcerated, children and teens in school, college students, researchers, the elderly, the undocumented, the avid learner, and the reluctant reader. You get the point. We are here for everyone, and we will continue to adapt and utilize new technology to serve our communities as new needs arise. We see all of this reflected in the 10 deserving librarians who through their warmth, creativity, and passion have made a difference in the lives of many. On behalf of the New York Public Library, I can say that we are proud to be part of this process, to be on the selection team, and to be here in celebration of our winners today. We appreciate your hard work and raise a toast to you for continued success in your roles in your respective communities. Congratulations. We also have two very special guests joining us today, award-winning authors Kate and M. Sarah Kleiss. Their latest collaboration is Don't Check Out This Book, Don't Check Out This Book, a middle grade novel inspired by none other than Kathy Evans, one of these years I love my librarians winners. Please join me in welcoming Kate and Sarah. So I'm Kate, the writing sister, and I'm Sarah, the illustrator. And we are both so happy to be here because we love librarians. And we are so grateful to librarians. We would not be doing what we do. We would not be who we are were it not for school librarians, public librarians, our brother, the high school librarian. Um, and it's funny because we did not have a great school library when we were growing up. We grew up in Peoria, Illinois, uh, and we went to a Catholic school that, whose library was down in the basement of the school with no windows, donated books, and um, that collection the nuns tried their best with, but it was not the best collection of books. We're not blaming anyone. They were doing the best they could. Uh, but the, the truth is they didn't have any resources. Um, I'm sure nobody gave them a book budget. Um, there was a lot of James, James Michener, as I recall, in there. Um, or in my mind, I call him James McKenner. Uh, <laughs> I remember thinking, I don't, who, what nine-year-old wants to read James McKenna? Um, but fortunately, we had a great public library in downtown Peoria, and that's where we met our people. Mrs. Pigwiggle, Amelia Bedelia, Pippi Longstocking, and our mother took us to the public library every two weeks from the age of zero to 18. Our, our two older sisters, our younger sister, our younger brother, and, and the two of us. And we basically relocated half of the children's collection to our house every two weeks. Um, because the books were so good, and the librarians were even better. And they, along with our parents, really made us fall in love with reading. And they set us on our life's path of becoming people who make books. You know, I, uh, I ended up uh, in, after college, I ended up in San Francisco. And when I arrived, I thought that I might go to graduate school and maybe get an art major here, since I was going to be, possibly be an illustrator. And I thought I either spend the money in graduate school or I get a free public library card. And I learned from the, person, the one person that I actually want to learn from, whose name is William Penny Dubois, who I fell in love with at about age 10. And because of the magic of libraries, I, because of interlibrary loan, 
I managed, and the librarians, I managed to read and study all of his 30 whatever books that he wrote. And I learned how to draw and how to pace a book from reading his books. And you got those postcards in the mail. I remember saying that a new one was It was waiting fantastic. For you. Um, was fantastic. I also learned from libraries, of course, from books, but also from librarians. I have learned so much from you people. And so, of course, our recent, our most recent book coming out in March, we had to dedicate to the rabble-rousing librarians and young readers in whom we place our last best hope for democracy. Uh, but there's one librarian in particular we want to thank, and that's Kathy Evans over here. I visited Kathy's school in 2014, and I was so impressed by it because it was so unlike the library we had grown, had grown up with. First of all, it was attractive, um, filled with fantastic books kids wanted to read, uh, comfy chairs, a coffee bar for the older students. And the thing that impressed me most was that in a very discreet corner in the library, there was a collection of books about edgy topics the kids want to read that they might be too embarrassed to check out. Um, and the deal, these books all had a green dot sticker on the spine. And the deal was this, any book that had a green dot sticker on the spine, you didn't have to check out. You could just put it in your backpack and return it when you wanted to. And you could read it very discreetly at home. And I was so impressed by this. I remember calling you or telling mm -hmm. you about it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I, of course, told Kathy how much I love this idea. And Kathy, being Kathy, um, said that it wasn't her original idea. She had gotten the idea from another librarian. And I remember thinking that blew me away, too, because as writers, I'm always stealing other people's ideas <laughs> and trying to pass them <laughs> off as my own, which is basically what we're doing in the new book. Um, but you can also see how this Green Dot collection is so unlike what's happening in my adopted state of Missouri, where they have this new um, bill under consideration. What is it, Sarah? Parental Oversight of Public Libraries Act. Poople, I guess, is the, what they're calling it. Um, it sounds like Sam <laughs> Kate would put in a book, actually. I know. It sounds, it I sounds like, like, did a, you write that? It sounds like a Simpsons gag or something. Um, but, you know, the home state of Mark Twain, you know he would be rolling over his grave at this, at this notion of people protecting children from books. Um, but I was a kid who was literally looking words up in the dictionary because I was so hungry for information. So um, this is a very long way of saying that thank you to Kathy for inspiring our latest book and to all the librarians who showed us how fun it is to have sewing machines in libraries and fishing poles and kites and cake pans and, and, books. and books. And books. Of course, of course, books. Books. Um, and thank you also to the librarians for showing us how librarians can inspire readers to take on corrupt politicians and wrong headed politicians, because that's also what the book is about. It's like the timeliest little book we've ever we've ever it made. Is. It is. So we just, uh, just to reiterate, we do want to thank you so much um, for not just those books we read a long time ago in school, but for continuing to inspire us today. Um, even on these school and library visits that we go and travel to all the time, um, we are continually impressed. So thank you so much. And one last thing about Kathy Evans. She is retiring at the end of this school year, and which means she'll have more time to devote to her d beloved spin classes. And if you visit her in Memphis, as I did, she will drag you to one of these spin classes. And she looks so innocent over here, but she will almost kill you on this bike going to nowhere. But um, she took mercy on me, so thank you for letting me live. And uh, thank you to all of you for helping us live bigger, fuller, happier lives. Now, ta -da -da -da, this is the time. Now we will meet our 10 winners, and we are thrilled to have members of the I Love My Librarian Selection Committee here to introduce the honorees. First, please welcome Catherine Roots Lewis, 
Director of Libraries and Instructional Technology for Norman Public Schools and immediate past president of the American Association of School Librarians. Thank you, Lloyda. I love librarians. I know that seems like an odd opening statement, but you all used it too in this context, but it's a sincere one. Traveling around the country over these three years, I have met thousands of school librarians who rely on ALA and AASL, their national association, to provide standards and guidelines for the profession. It is wonderful to be part of this exciting ceremony with people who share so many of similar passions, libraries, academic, public, school, and special, as you know, share many commonalities. Among them, the commitment to create libraries that are magical places for children and adults alike, where all learners explore, imagine, daydream, calculate, read, reflect, discuss, learn, the list is literally limitless, and librarians make it happen. Our commonalities bind us together, while our uniquenesses ensure every citizen the access to expertise and the spirit that is embodied in libraries across our nation. Like Kate and Sarah, and I appreciate this segue, I grew up in a small town in the Panhandle of Texas where the library was in a closet in my school. And you were allowed to go once a week to check out a book. Happily, my home, like yours, was filled with reading and discussion. My parents took my sister and me to the public library regularly. My early memories of that library inc were include sitting on a cold glass block floor in the adult nonfiction section in the heat of the summer, flipping through archaeology books, first because I enjoyed the pictures, but second because the floors were cool and it was hot in the summer. Both of those experiences actually framed my desire to be a school librarian. Why schools? Because I wanted all learners to have access and opportunities day in and day out to learn and to imagine, just like our four school librarians have done. As school librarians, we champion learners to transform teaching and learning through our leadership as collaborators, teachers, innovators, technologists, and information professionals. I have the fortune of being a school library supervisor in Norman, and I have the opportunity to visit school libraries every day. And what I see is deep learning that school librarians afford learners that generally has me in awe. Recently, I had the privilege of watching second graders, remember these little people are seven years old, share their inquiry projects. The result of a co-taught unit between a school librarian and a classroom educator. These young children were studying figures in American history during a social studies unit built around the concept of social justice. Their projects were literally remarkable. One learner used clay to create a clay sculpture depicting the March on Washington. He finished the project relatively quickly compared to all the other children in his class. And when asked if he wanted to paint his clay figures, perhaps to take more time, like the other children, who, repre who represented the people marching on this, in this important march, he quickly replied, no, I want them to all be the same color because Martin Luther King Jr. believed that all people were created equal. This is from the mouth of a second grader. This young learner certainly had an understanding of the profound impact of Martin Luther King Jr. The scaffolding provided by the school librarian in collaboration with the classroom educator who fostered this child's learning certainly illustrates the unique role of the school librarian in the school learning community. As school librarians navigate the ever-changing learning landscape, and it changes every day for us, they provide secure, safe places where learners flourish, they build relationships with learners. Today, I am so proud and honored, privileged to present these four amazing women to you who are school librarians who champion students every day and have played a pivotal role in learning and teaching in their school communities. I would like to start with Stephanie Donnell. She has opened up new worlds for Bertram 
community school students through innovative educational technology. She has introduced state-of-the-art tools like, like mixed reality headsets, architecture software, 3D printers, the list goes on, into the learning process, allowing students of all levels to unleash their creativity and discover the magic of STEAM learning. She also extends her passion for technology instruction to adults in Bertrand, offering free tutorials after school and during, during the summer for anyone hoping to learn more about apps and devices. Stephanie has created an amazing example of what a modern school library can be. One nominator writes, her creativity and innovative nature have helped her students create projects that other educators have only, haven't even dreamt of yet. Congratulations, Stephanie. Will you join me on stage, please? Thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. I am truly honored and humbled to be here today. Let me begin by thanking the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the New York Public Library, the New York Times, and the American Library Association for sponsoring this award and honoring librarians. When I was first notified of this award and provided a copy of my nomination, I was overwhelmed by the incredibly kind words used to describe me by my school superintendent, Dr. Dennis Shipp, along with many of my fellow coworkers, community members, and students who all contributed to my nomination. When I hear the word librarian, I think of one word, opportunity. As a young girl, I spent a lot of time at the Hastings Public Library. I loved going to the library because I looked forward to Honey Lou Bonner greeting me with a warm smile and a big hug. Honey Lou was a children's librarian and provided numerous opportunities for me to explore and enjoy a variety of authors and genres. I discovered my love of nonfiction literature because of her suggestions. She also had a way of making the library a cool place to be, and I wanted to be just like her. So thank you, Honey Lou, for inspiring me to become a librarian and making me aware of the opportunities such a career choice could, would provide. Fast forward to 2013. Superintendent Dr. Dennis Shipp and the Bertrand School Board offered me the opportunity to be the school librarian and tech integration specialist. Our little town in south central Nebraska has a population of 750 people with 260 students in the K-12 building. Because Bertrand has no public library, I wanted to make sure the school library would provide a fun and friendly place for our students, where literacy and technology opportunities were abundant during school, after school, and even during summer vacation. Today's library isn't a room filled with tables, shelves, books, and the occasional person getting shh. Our library is a room filled with opportunities where you'll find students engaged in 3D design, students building and creating in the makerspace, students taking a virtual field trip anywhere in the world, and yes, students enjoying a good book. A visitor to our library might even see our industrial tech teacher, Bill Ford, and his students inspecting their CAD drawings using the Microsoft HoloLens. This device allows students to incorporate mixed reality in order to walk around their design, view it at any angle, and even walk inside of it. It also allows students to inspect and modify their designs before they are sent to the 3D printer. The HoloLens opens a new world of opportunities for students and hopefully inspires and prepares them for future careers that do not currently exist. The innovative programs offered in the library are a collaborative effort. 
Thank you to all the community members that volunteer to be guest readers, the administrative team that is open and supportive of new programs and ideas, and the local area community foundations that provide grant opportunities. I am also thankful for my friends Kate, Nancy, Lana, Wade, Rosanna, and Bill for always willing to let me bounce ideas off of them and listen to me excitedly talk about the newest tech gadget or tool I've just discovered. Because of the constant support and encouragement of my family, my husband Dave, and my children Andy, Haley, and Jaden, and those members of my family and friends who are able to attend today, I was able to pursue my passion to become a librarian and provide opportunities for others to become lifelong learners. Thank you. At the St. Mary's Episcopal School Library, Kathy Evans has developed a culture of lifelong learning and self-expression. Her efforts range from a fireside chat series for students and teachers to discuss sensitive issues, to a College Libraries 101 program preparing graduating seniors for their academic futures. She also advocates for libraries beyond the walls of St. Mary's, arranging for visiting authors to also speak at local public schools and even inviting members of Congress to hear from learners about why library funding matters. What a great way to advocate. In the words of one colleague, Kathy lives as an example for other budding scholars. Congratulations, Kathy. Will you join me on stage? What a wonderful and fulfilling adventure this has been. 47 years. 47 years ago, I began my library journey, fresh out of college with my library degree. And looking around this room, that's probably before some of you were born. So to put it in perspective, all cataloging was original. And I typed catalog card sets on a typewriter. It was electric. So you can imagine the innovations, challenges, and transitions the past 47 years have brought. When I went back to school to get my master's degree, I wrote a research paper on what was referred to then as bibliotherapy, a term first defined by ALA in 1966. That's according to Wikipedia. I didn't triangulate that information. In 2005, I was reading my professional literature and ran across an article about a school librarian who had curated a collection of books dealing with issues students might be grappling with. She strategically placed them in an obscure place in the library so they could be examined in private. Maybe it was because of that bibliotherapy paper, but that really spoke to me and inspired me to do one of the most, most meaningful things I think I've done in my career. For any of you who work in school libraries or with adolescents, pre-adolescents, you know how hard it is for them to grow up. Growing up is hard stuff. Young people need to know that whatever they're dealing with, whatever they're experiencing, whatever they are feeling is not unique. It's so comforting for them to know that others have had these issues and that what they're feeling is normal. To let a young person know that they're going to be okay is one of the finest gifts we can give them. And so it began. What became known in my library as the Green Dot Collection. I met with my guidance counselors to get a better understanding of the issues that my students were dealing with. St. Mary's is an all-girls school, so you can imagine perfectionism, body image, eating disorders. 
but it was like a punch in the stomach when I realized I needed books on cutting and trichotillomania. That's hair pulling, but I just wanted to impress y'all with that big word today. Then there's a the usual hit parade of ADD, ODD, OCD, addictions, bullying, so on, so on. So we found the most out of the way place we could find to put these books. But we realized we had to come up with a way to easily identify them. And it didn't take long for the idea of a green dot on the spine of the book to emerge. Easy to identify, while at the same time, sending the not so subtle message to go, go get these books. When all was in place, I gathered my student library ambassadors and sent them out to the homerooms to tell their fellow students about this resource in the library. That was 16 years ago, and the Green Dot Collection is now part of our culture, a part of the fabric of our school. Even though our library has a self-checkout system, we wanted to take privacy a step further. So we took the radical approach of saying, don't check out this book, just put it in your backpack, put it in your book bag, all we ask is that you bring it back so that others might benefit from it. Every time I walk by that green dot shelf and I see all those books in disarray, it makes me smile. I can honestly say that we've had very little loss of books over the years, and if you lose a few along the way, well, it's kind of gratifying, don't you think? To know that you've made that good of a selection, to know that there's a book in a child's hand that they just can't put down and let go, in 2014, I invited Kate Kleist to come to St. Mary's. And while she was visiting, I gave her a tour of our library and explained the Green Dot Collection. And I think it struck a chord with Kate as well. She continued to think about it and wrote her book, Don't Check Out This Book. It's about a curly-headed librarian, illustrated by Sarah. And the librarian's name is, check this, Rita Be Dangerous who encourages students to not check books out of the library. Just take them. So Kate wrote me a note, and I, share, I would like to share just a little bit of that note. I was blown away when I visited St. Mary's back in 2014 and saw your community of enthusiastic young readers. What impressed me most was the Green Dot collection of books along the back wall of your library. It's not an exaggeration to say I would have been a different person if I had books like those available to me at my Catholic school in the 70s. I would also like to, cha uh, to share with you something she they wrote in the acknowledgments in the back of their book. After thanking the editors, they go on to say, but it's the librarians who have surprised us the most. Who knew there was such a sly, smart, subversive band of bookworms devoted to spreading mischief and mayhem, and we mean that in the best way, in schools and public libraries on a daily basis. This book is our tribute to them. It is a tribute to all librarians, especially those of you who work with young people on a daily basis to help them navigate their world. I would like to thank ASL for enriching my journey in so many ways. And I want to thank the I Love My Librarian Committee and all of the sponsoring organizations for honoring me with this award. It is particularly meaningful because I am retiring at the end of the school year. I would love nothing more than to leave a legacy of green dot collections and libraries all over this country. And I believe Kate and Sarah brought some green dots with them today. Thank you so much. Melissa Glandon's colleagues at Powhatan High School have dubbed her an evangel librarian, one who seeks to convert students and teachers alike to be staunch patrons of the school library. Indeed, Melissa has spread the love of reading, learning, and creating throughout her community by transforming the school's makerspace into a vibrant hub of activity and expanding outreach to readers of all levels and interests. She is also committed to collaboration and service. For example, and I love this, she worked with the school's carpentry classes to plan and construct, you wanna guess, little free libraries across the Powhatan area. 
Melissa's efforts have truly fostered a culture of literacy and creativity throughout her school community. Congratulations, Melissa. Will you join me? I'd like to start off by thanking ALA and my school administrators at Powhatan High School for the once in a never life moment right now. I'm going to publicly embrace the nickname Evangelite Berrien. My admin, Michelle Martin, gave it to me when I told her I wanted to evangelize the benefits of a librarian and what they can bring to the table. For me, being a school librarian is about the wide, evolving umbrella we carry to cover the needs of our students, teachers, and community, and how all of these pieces can benefit and learn from one another. This will be a story about education, building an educator and librarian, and filling the library toolbox. I like to say that I've taught my way across Virginia through career and family moves. I've been a librarian at all school levels. Virginia's librarians help me grow and inspire me when they welcome me into their libraries to explore, mentor me, collaborate with me, and share their awesomeness across Twitter and conferences. I have the added benefit of being in a state with library rock stars that shape state and natural, national standards and policies. Every school librarian makes an impact in big and small ways in and out of their library, instructionally, academically, creative, creatively, and culturally. I've always loved the feel of a library. Everyone belongs, a place for a kid like me, shy, anxious introvert looking for a place to hide for a bit. I didn't find a library career right away, but it eventually found me. I started down the path of elementary education because I like teaching and giving every student access to learning that sparked their curiosity and opportunity to explore and create and connect to the world outside the school, no matter what their academic labels were. While in a master's class for educational leadership, a retired principal said something that I've kept in my toolbox for 19 years. Curriculum and instruction are important, but the defining question is really, what are the needs of your school and community? I didn't know at the time that I wouldn't be managing a school. I would be using those lessons to manage libraries. After a few years of teaching, I was looking for a creative corner in the education world that a basil didn't dictate literature, where I could design, advocate, and sail the ship to where my students needed it to go. And I found that in the library. In my first job as an elementary librarian, Principal Dr. Valika Gatling gave me the opportunity to uh, renovate, reinvigorate a library program in its space and introduced me to the work of Ruby Payne into my toolbox. The effects the culture of poverty has on education and the students walking through my library doors. Changing your viewpoint changes your world. I try my best daily to meet my students where they are and to grow with them. When Mrs. Susanna Panter was my first and only district library supervisor with a teaching and library background, my toolbox was given confidence, advocacy at my back, and professional knowledge streaming to me. This is where our digital world of learning communities helps those of us who do not have a degreed library supervisor. Through the University of South Carolina MLIS online cohort, I saw how I could fit the public library programming piece into a public school maker culture and expanded my tools and knowledge about inclusion and diversity. The win-win benefits were evident by my library spaces becoming a place where students wanted to be. I love libraries at all levels. I like to say that you can't take a librarian, you can take a librarian out of elementary but you can't take the elementary out of a librarian. You have to have a lot of tricks up your sleeve, good planning and tons of energy. And there are still days where I wish somebody at the high school would read with me a picture book. But what I found at the high school level is that the kids need just as much attention. I might not be helping blow noses and tie shoes anymore. And yes, I'm supporting students to meet the teacher's expectations and deadlines and library and inquiry. 
but I get to help develop young adults that have big questions about their future and themselves, who sometimes need a space to take a breath, who just need to know how to use the printer and get out of the library, <laughs> who haven't checked out a book since elementary school and I'm able to hook them with a graphic novel, who have found the makerspace as a place to make for a class for themselves or a good cause. I love my Powhatan High School. It's in the only high school in a semi-rural, small but mighty county on the skirts of Richmond, Virginia. It's such a big part of the community and I'm still an infant in the timeline of their history. My library is a co-librarian that gives our program balance and our space is a vibrant, redesigned, flexible learning commons. Being a librarian at the high school, in my high school, is like being a kid in a candy store. I have every tool in the toolbox available for me to try out and to find ways to tie it all together for authentic student learning who will soon be adult citizens. I can reach for collaboration and build instruction with teachers in world languages, science, carpentry, tourism and hospitality, life skills, and so on. I'm fortunate to teach in an innovative school that looks to embrace students on a personal and academic level and a community filled with people ready to help students succeed. I'm, in, I'm fortunate to work with Ms. Maury Pace, who is an innovation specialist and the champion of libraries in the district. To new librarians and educators out there looking for a new path or to make a broader impact, be brave, persevere, fill your toolbox to meet the needs around you. To administrators and local boards, love your librarian. Do what you can to listen to them and support them. Give them the tools and resources they need. Give them a library assistant. If you don't have a school librarian, fight for one. They are your catch-all tool. It's a position in the school that will give you the biggest bang for your buck in terms of returns. I hope I've made the impact I intended, but to be honest, the library world saved me. It saved me and has kept me in education for the last 12 years. It saved me the last two and a half with daily potential and possibilities after I lost my eight-year-old daughter, Grace, to sudden cardiac arrest on the very first day in the high school library. But all of this library passion and love is able to come to me because of the support of my husband, Brian, and my two boys, Brody and Eric. They've allowed me to give my time and energy to a cause and career I believe in and every school librarian knows your kids are library kids, and your partner is often the backbone of many labor-intensive projects. And they are the greatest wind behind this librarian's wings. Thank you. At H. Grady Spruce High School, Tracy Walker Reed is a champion for literacy, equity, and inclusion, determined to give underserved learners resources they need to succeed in school and beyond. Tracy has extended the library's hours, created tu tutoring programs, and even opened up the library to children and families living in the neighborhood. She strives to curate the library's collection to reflect the varied interests, reading levels, and backgrounds in her school community. Her nominator writes, her humble and generous spirit creates a warm and inviting place in the library for scholars and staff. I love that. All who step in know that they are welcome. Congratulations, Tracy. Will you come up to the stage? <laughs> Good afternoon. It is an honor to be recognized for doing something that I love doing, which is helping and serving my school community. There are so many people that have poured into my life, and they are part of the reason why I'm standing here today. First, I'd like to thank my family, 
my mom and my grandparents. They have always encouraged me to accomplish any goal that I set. One of the most fondest memories um, of my mom when I was a little girl was taking me to the bookmobile. And I know some of our maybe people that are listening or here today may not know what the bookmobile is, but it was like a big bus and it was like a library on wheels. And so you could go there and check out books when you didn't have a local um, branch library that was close by. And I remember getting my library card too at the same time. There, I never lacked for books in my home. My family always purchased books or I borrowed books from school. And I've shared that same love for books and reading with my children, Lauren Camden and Mackenzie. I would like to also thank my friends from my church and my sorority who are like family. Some of my friends today are here in person and some who were not able to attend are watching the live feed, the live stream online. I greatly appreciate your support and I couldn't have done a lot of the things that I'm doing right now without you. I have been fortunate to have some amazing teachers and instructors throughout my educational experience. Their high expectations have been forever embedded in me. I would also like to thank my work family at H. Grady Spruce High School, which is a part of Dallas Independent School District in Dallas, Texas. Without them, I wouldn't be here today either. A group of my coworkers got together and put together an amazing nomination packet about the things that I do on a daily basis that impacts the students and the staff on my campus. I am forever grateful and I'm very excited to be here to represent my school as well. Um, part of the reason why I became a librarian is because initially I was in education, I was an elementary teacher, and one of the favorite things that I liked to do with my classes was to read. And so after doing some investigation, I started library school at Texas Women's University, and here I am. I am, I will be honest, I am at a large high school and sometimes the needs, just meeting the needs of students and staff can be overwhelming, but I'm grateful for the opportunities because when I find out their needs, then it stretches me, it changes my way of thinking, and it also pushes me to learn new things so that I'm able to meet their needs. I would also like to thank the ALA and the nominating committee for this opportunity. It is a once in a lifetime opportunity and I will remember it forever. Thank you. I told you the four of them were awesome. Give a big round of applause for those four school librarians. I'd like to welcome to the stage Lauren Presley, my colleague, Associate, Associate Dean of the University of Washington Libraries and immediate past president of the Association of College and Research Libraries. She will introduce the three winners from academic libraries. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and hello everyone, it's my absolute pleasure to help highlight this year's academic librarian winners who have gone above and beyond for their institution's students, faculty, staff, as well as for their larger, larger local communities and for librarianship as a whole. These winners exemplify how college and university librarians are active partners in research. Librarians organize and disseminate books and journals and these are very important activities, but also academic librarians actively contribute to the creation of new scholarship through close collaboration with faculty and students. Academic librarians are also leaders in inclusivity. Today's winners have strived to build more equitable campuses and communities. They've made a profound impact through innovative outreach to people with disabilities, educational, program, educational programming for indigenous librarians, and open access efforts to ensure students from all economic backgrounds can find the materials they need for their studies. 
Libraries and their staff are truly at the heart of their colleges and universities. And it's been moving to see just how beloved Jesus, Marianne, and Leah are in their communities. As their nominators attest, today's winners have already begun inspiring and empowering future generations of academic librarians. Please join me in celebrating these three outstanding individuals for all they've accomplished on their campuses and beyond. Jesus Alonso Regalado's research expertise and generous spirit have made him an indispensable resource for the University of Albany scholars. He's a gifted and proactive instructor designing interactive courses based on student feedback. With faculty, he's an enthusiastic collaborator, often finding relevant books or articles for professors without even being asked. He's also a leader in open access, actively working with instructors to ensure students can find assigned reading for free at the library. As one nominator puts it, the University at Al Albany Library is a better, more intellectually stimulating, and more inclusive place when Jesus is there. Congratulations, Jesus. Please join me on stage. Uh, buenas tardes, good afternoon. First of all, gracias. I want to express my gratitude to those who created this award for, for basing it in, on a sentiment so fundamentally necessary to the human experience, love. Every day, millions of user interactions with librarians happen nationwide. This award brings visibility to these connections. Every time I travel to a city or town, I visit their libraries. They are this country's best public service, and that is greatly due to you librarians. Since an early age in my home country, Spain, I wanted to be a librarian so that I could connect people with the information they need. This task, in all its intricacies, is the basic tenet of a profession that fills my heart with joy. We all have librarians we love, and if you don't, then go find one. There are plenty out there. The librarians that I love are the ones in the trenches, making a daily impact in people's lives. They are generous with personal time and easily accessible. I feel fortunate to have met and worked with librarians like this. I dedicate this award to those librarians that speak up, that are part of the communities, and fight tirelessly for them. Also, as a librarian born and raised in another country, I would like to dedicate this award to the foreign librarians that have developed a career in the United States. We enthusiastic, enthusiastically contribute to your communities. I hope that libraries will keep hiring us. I'm thankful that my university, UAlbany, did. I've been fortunate to develop a career as a subject librarian in the United States. I believe in the value of Soviet knowledge and language expertise in libraries. We cannot forget the importance of building unique, strong collections which embrace multiple voices and different perspectives. To achieve this, we must continue developing collections that include materials published in other countries and in other languages. I appreciate that ALA provides support for its members to attend book fairs such as in Guadalajara and Buenos Aires. I hope that ALA can expand these programs which are essential to maintaining the diversity in our collections. This vision of developing collections constantly informs my information literacy practices. How can we develop well-rounded research about the US-Mexican border without access to me Mexican sources? How can we fully understand indigenous social movements without the primary sources created by them? As students need to learn how to find and evaluate resources from other cultures in order to understand the complexity of the research projects. We librarians should support teaching, learning, and research in an increasingly interconnected global environment that is not exclusively in English. Let us be receptive to cultural practices from around the world, such as the Global South's creative and fearless approach to open access. As an academic librarian, I am nothing 
without my faculty and students. Due to our continued collaboration, we were able to design sustainable information literacy programs integrated into the curriculum that reach, uh, reach out to every student in the three academic departments that I support. The key to successful programs is to accomplish them with our users, not just for them. But how can we build significant connections with users? By showing them empathy and providing them an inclusive space so that they feel part of our libraries. If they love us, it's because we as librarians are committed to building long-lasting connections with our communities. Algorithms cannot do this yet. There are many concrete ways to demonstrate our dedication to serving our communities. Today, let me mention one. You might have heard of the efforts to change the subject heading illegal aliens. Let's change it in our library catalogs. If we can only do this at the local level for right now, so be it. What's important is taking a stand. No human being is illegal. In closing, <laughs> in closing, Nobel Prize winner Gabriel Garcia Marquez was once asked, why do you write? And he said, I write to be loved. This makes me wonder why I'm a librarian. Why do I do what I do? My answer could be because it gives me meaning to my life. I would also like to add what keeps me motivated and passionate as a librarian is the love and appreciation of students and faculty. They are the reason why I'm here today. De todo corazón, gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize Marianne Hansen. She's a leader not just at Montana State University, but in the library profession overall. As the lead coordinator for the Tribal College Librarians Professional, De Profe Professional Development Institute, Mary Ann supports librarians at tribal colleges as well as librarians serving indigenous populations at other institutions. The TCLI is a week-long professional development opportunity for frequently under-resourced librarians, and Marianne has secured nearly $1 million of grant funding to defray travel costs for attendees and speakers. Her nominators praise her commitment to uplifting the voices of indigenous librarians, writing, Marianne is a leader in the tribal college library community because she is constantly listening and learning. Congratulations, Marianne. Please join me on stage. Thank you all for being here, and I am so honored. What a joy. Thank you to the American Library Association, the Carnegie Corporation, the American, um, excuse me, the New York Public Library, and the New York Times. This is such a great honor indeed. I think my mom planted the seed for my career in librarianship. She was my middle school librarian. And hi, Lorraine. And <laughs> sorry. There, there have been so many people in my life that have been so inspirational to me. And starting from, well, I guess 24 years ago, I felt like I had won the lottery when I became a librarian at the Montana State University Library, Montana's land grant university. And one piece of our mission at Montana State University is to be the institution of choice for Montana's indigenous college students and students beyond. And it's just been such a wonderful complimentary theme with my work with the Tribal College Librarians Institute. Through my work at MSU, I, through the years, I've had some incredibly supportive deans. And one of my deans, my current dean, is in the audience, Dr. Kenning Arlich. And he's, it's an inspirational, forward-thinking leader. And he's one of many that have um, really created an environment where we as Lang Grant University librarians feel empowered to be involved in any number of service and outreach activities. Yes, I'm a research and instruction librarian. and 
day to day. I get to work with nursing students, education students, faculty across those disciplines, psychology and so on, doing research consultations, going into classrooms and uh, teaching library research skills. But indeed, I think probably my biggest passion, the best hat that I get to wear is my work with the Tribal College Librarians Professional Development Institute, which I started, I guess I'm in my 23rd year getting to work with TCLI. And um, as you heard, it's been well, well supported with funding by IMLS. Thank you if there's any IML Institute of Museum and Library Services crew in the house. Thank you so much. And I have to thank my colleague Jan Zuha for writing my letter of nomination and soliciting letters of support from three of the Tribal College librarians, Erin, Rhiannon, and Tracy. Thank you so much. I noted that Lorreen Roy, Dr. Lorreen Roy, has been um, an incredible supporter of the Tribal College Librarians Institute, the first indigenous librarian, uh, president of the American Library Association. It would be disingenuous for me to hold an annual plan and hold an annual professional development institute for indigenous librarians as a non-indigenous librarian if I didn't get the um, deep caring advice from Lorene over the years and Dr. Sandy Littletree, an indigenous librarian at the University of Washington I School and some of the tribal college librarians themselves, such as Aaron Laura from Boys at Blackfeet Community College in Montana and Joy Bridwell at Stonechild College in Montana. I just get to sit back and enjoy the ride. The tribal college librarians largely uh, form the agenda every year, push the programming and provide a lot of the programming as they're doing wonderful programs on indigenizing um, the controlled vocabularies for organizing their collections. They are preserving oral histories. They're doing digitization projects. They are really an inspirational group. They are the tribal college librarians, but they are also serving their community. So they are also largely serving as community and public librarians. And I just can't say enough, if you don't know any tribal college librarians, I would encourage you to meet some tribal college librarians. and. I just lost my thought. Um, I have to thank other supporters, uh, other people who have got, been up here. I mean, look at this community that um, I'm in. I feel like there are so many people who are worthy of this award, but we establish community in our workplace. Yes, I love that how a previous speaker said, um, thank my work family. I really do feel like I have a strong supportive work family, but I'm also deeply indebted to my family, my husband at home, who's home taking care of our dogs and cats, and while well, I got to travel here with my wonderful colleague Jan, and my niece Christy, who, along with her roommate Kylie, came from center, the center of uh, Pennsylvania. They left the college studies behind for a weekend to come support me for this. So thank you all. Keep doing great work and uh, keep inspiring. And finally, I'd like to recognize Leah Plotarczyk. She's honored for her innovation, compassion, and commitment to inclusion. At Florida Atlantic University, Leah created a book club for adults with intellectual disabilities, the first of its kind in an academic library. The book club is both a key service to our community and an opportunity for much needed special education research. Plotarczyk develops innovative tactics to engage participants and closely documents which strategies are most successful, publishing her findings in journals and in an upcoming book. Her nominator writes that it is a special blend of intelligence, integrity, courage, compassion, and determination, all bound together by love that underpins Leah's accomplishments. Congratulations, Leah. Thank you so much. It is a true honor to be here today. And after reading the nominations of the fellow award recipients, I feel ever so proud to call myself a librarian. My mom, who is a retired first grade teacher, 
taught my sister me to read at a very young age. And she likes to tell the story of me pretending to read my very favorite children's book titled Petunia, which happened to be about a silly goose named Petunia who finds a book, tucks it under her arm, and then convinces her barnyard friends that she is all wise, all knowing, and can read. And because I had been read the story many times, like Petunia, I decided to fool my mom's teacher friends into believing that I too could read at the very young age of four, when actually I had just memorized the story almost word for word. But I'd like to think that it was this early love of reading and storytelling and sharing of books that nudged me toward my career in librarianship. And when I graduated with my MLS 13 years ago, I had no idea the many opportunities that would await me. I felt prepared to build a collection. I felt ready to give a library instruction. I even felt okay about overseeing a budget. But what I didn't know is that one day I'd be hosting a birthday party for a service dog named Clay and that one of the most favorite and most rewarding parts of my job would be sitting in a circle, reading, playing educational games with college students who have intellectual disabilities. Over the last four years, I've had the pleasure of getting to know this amazing group of students who defy all odds. These students don't allow their disabilities to get in the way of them experiencing college, and they certainly don't allow their disabilities to get in the way of them experiencing life to the fullest. And I often tell them that I learned so much more from them than they could ever possibly learn from me. Some of the valuable life lessons that I've learned from my students include the importance of slowing down and really appreciating the little things, as well as finding the joy in the unexpected. I've also learned a great deal about practicing patience compassion, humility, and the value of acceptance. But probably the most important lesson I've learned from these students is that we really aren't so different after all. And I've learned these lessons while sharing the joy of reading, which is what I love about our profession. Librarianship pushes us to connect with others and to find commonalities. Our profession isn't just about books and reading, it's about overcoming barriers. And I feel so fortunate to work in this profession that values inclusivity, celebrates differing abilities, and promotes a love for people and the stories that unite us. Ours is a profession that encourages us to take risks, to stand up for the underserved, the marginalized, and even the forgotten. And my own award today would not have been possible without the hard work and the support of many. And some of you are in the audience today. First of all, I'd like to recognize Dean Carol Hickson. Thank you. Thank you so much for your continued support, for nurturing my leadership skills, and for allowing me to pursue a project that brings me such great satisfaction. Thank you to Matthew Connor for that generous and kind nomination, but more than that, for seeing my potential and for always pushing me to do and to be better. Thank you, Eileen Carter, my friend, my former library classmate, for taking the train in today to celebrate this special moment with me. I also would like to thank Mary Lee Brown and Linda Lesbrons back in Florida for all of their contributions to the book club. They have worked tirelessly They've given so much of their time and energy and dedication, and without them, book club would not be the success that it is. I need to thank my parents who introduced my sister and me to the wonders of literature and libraries at a very young age. They filled our homes with books, they promoted and supported education, and they told us that we could do and be anything. And finally, thank you to ALA, the award selection committee, the award sponsors, the Carnegie Corporation, the New York Times, the New York Public Library, for this remarkable honor. I feel grateful to be recognized for something that brings me such professional and personal joy. And I would like to dedicate this award to my book club buddies. You have impacted my life in ways that you may never know. I commend you for your courage, your honesty, and your perseverance. 
and I feel proud to call you my friends. And it's because of you that I am standing here today. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have another round of applause for our academic librarians? Finally, we'll hear from Ramiro Salazar, director of the San Antonio Public Library and president of the Public Library Association, who will introduce this year's three outstanding public librarian winners. Thank you, Lauren. Hello and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for making time today to join us to honor and celebrate the winners that we're presenting to you of the I Love My Librarian Award. I'm honored to present today's three public librarian winners whose work is a powerful testament to the essential role public libraries play in today's world. The work of these three awardees demonstrate the power of public libraries to transform lives. Public libraries are hubs, community hubs, connecting low-income populations with much-needed access to the digital world. They are gathering places. They offer spaces for various experiences, opportunities for community members to come together and reflect on the issues that matter. They offer places for families and kids of all kinds who can be empowered by the many resources, activities, and programs and experiences that public libraries offer to our communities. Public libraries are the most democratic institutions we have. It's a place where everyone is welcome no matter where they come from, no matter what their needs are. With, determin with determination and compassion, these librarians that are being honored today, public librarians, created innovative programs and built a culture of inclusion to ensure that everyone in their communities can prosper. Homa, Maria, and Janet, thank you for your tireless service to your communities let us give them a hand for their amazing, amazing work. Homa Nafasi at Hartford Public Library. Homa leads the American Place, an intensive initiative providing resources and education to refugees and immigrants. Under her leadership, Hartford Public Library became the first library in the nation to be licensed to provide legal services to immigrants. She has also developed the innovative Crossroads to Connectivity Project, which equips low-income adults with long-term access to laptops and Wi-Fi in order to advance their careers in education. HOMA epitomizes how librarians empower our most vulnerable communities through access to information, in the words of the nominator, she is the epitome of a visionary and dedicated librarian, and her career has been devoted to creating services to underserved, underserved populations. Congratulations, Homa. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. The theme of love is definitely in the air at this afternoon's event, and I thought it fitting to open by recognizing the role love of our work plays in the American Place's absolute commitment to welcoming the stranger into their new home city of Hartford. Hartford Public Library's The American Place was established 20 years ago to offer programs such as citizenship and English language instruction 
in support of immigrant and refugees resettlement. However, over the past decade or so, there have been increasing forces at play in the universe, driving us away from our basic human regard for one another and making it increasingly more challenging for the new arrival to feel welcomed. While undeniably social media and the internet have opened the door to facilitating connections across the globe, these very same cutting edge communication connectors seem paradoxically to be fostering a greater sense of isolation among all of us in society. A simple example involves one's riding an elevator. Each time I get on an elevator, whether in a business or residential setting, fellow riders are deep in conversation on their cell phones. No greeting, no eye contact, no acknowledgement of being in the presence of other human beings. This growing human disconnectedness is powerfully described in Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone. We are spending less and less time socializing with our neighbors or participating in those vital social and civic groups that foster a sense of togetherness, community, and belonging. Recognizing this trend back in 2010, at the peak of refugee resettlement efforts among Hartford agencies, the American Place added a completely new dimension to its work with immigrant newcomers, one based on Putnam's concept of building networks of trusting relationships. A project was developed to go beyond simply providing much needed basic services directly to immigrants, but we also consciously extended our support by more deeply involving long-term residents from the local receiving community to offer their time, caring, and wisdom to support new arrival immigrants at levels where these immigrants would feel more strongly connected to the broader community and experience an authentic sense of belonging. Several activities were implemented to accelerate this process. Volunteers were recruited and trained to serve as cultural navigators and citizenship guides. Community dialogues were organized where diverse participants identified shared concerns and took action together to address them. And a citywide communications campaign was launched called We Belong Here, Hartford. At times, it feels like an uphill battle. In recent years, xenophobic commentary on the internet has exploded. And while I'm optimistic that this will subside, I'm also realistic to know that at some point in time, it will rear its ugly head once again. And thus, I cannot overemphasize to you the importance of public libraries maintaining our unique positioning that draws many different types of people together to share their diverse ideas, viewpoints, and experiences. By providing a safe, neutral setting, our surrounding communities gain the trust, respect, and self-confidence to listen to one another and share their own stories of struggle and triumph. As a result, as people get to know each other, they become far less capable of stereotyping, fearing, or misjudging the other. While it may be difficult to love someone or something unknown to us, we have the tools to mobilize around the notion that it's impossible to hate someone once you know their story. In closing, I would like to thank the Carnegie Foundation, New York Times, New York Public Library, the I Love My Librarian Committee, my local nominators, Bridget Quinn Carey, CEO, and TAP colleague Nancy Cadigan, the staff at Hartford Public Library, and of course, ALA for loving our librarians, and ergo, the libraries that house us and spare us on to do the work we do lovingly. Thank you. Maria Papa Natusiu, efforts have helped make Arlington Heights Memorial Library a beloved destination for special needs children and their caregivers. 
She has developed welcoming play groups for children with visible and invisible needs, as well as programs for families to connect with, connect with local development therapists. Community members have described these efforts as life-changing. With sensitivity and dedication, Maria is always working to make the library more inclusive for all. Her nominator writes, Maria's willingness to embrace, listen, and be open to new ideas underscores her keen ability to take small suggestions and envision the greater good and bigger possibilities. Congratulations, Maria. Thank you for this great, great honor. Um, to my nominators, uh, the award sponsors, and the awards committee. I am truly honored by receiving this award. I am very proud to represent public libraries as a youth librarian and serving the, com the community of Arlington Heights. I didn't anticipate the depths of experiences that being a youth librarian could offer. There are so many ways to engage the community while supporting youth, caregivers, and those who serve youth in our communities. In a typical week as a youth librarian, I could find myself, well, I guess dressed up like a superhero is one thing. I didn't put that on here. Um, sharing scholarship info and then making handmade alphabet books with expectant and parenting teens, all while munching on snacks, because there has to be snacks if there are teens. Or playing on the floor with babies while chatting and sharing resources on postnatal care with new parents alongside a local nurse or demonstrating how to use the library catalog and then making homemade Play-Doh while we talk about the importance of play with immigrant women and children as part of a state literacy grant. Or welcoming caregivers, kids, and therapists to coffee, caregivers, and play on a Sunday morning. What all of these varied experiences have in common is centering the library as a place of community. In some cases, it invites those who may not be familiar with libraries to join us or in other cases, it can welcome and repair relationships with audiences who may not feel welcome in libraries. We want to demonstrate in our community connections that it does take a village to raise a child and support their caregivers, and we want the library to be the center of that village. And sometimes, the village needs to expand its walls to welcome in new communities. It's amazing to think that I'm standing here today in part because of a patron request to build a new community within our village. When my community partner, Beth Deiter, a local speech pathologist, approached the library almost five years ago to see if we were interested in helping her create a play group for families with kids receiving therapy services, I don't think either of us really knew the trajectory that our partnership would take us both on. Beth had an online presence with a Facebook support group at that time of around a few hundred members, but no physical location for families to meet other than renting a room at the library periodically. We saw a real potential for the library to serve as a place for this community to find support, connect them with resources, and have fun playing and learning together. Leaning on the resources and support from my local library networking group, SNAILS, uh, which stands for Special Needs and Inclusive Library Services, Beth and I have worked on creating a community that now has expanded beyond just my library, but to others in the Chicagoland area as well. Beth felt so encouraged by the success of her community's online presence, as well as seeing the impact of offering in-person opportunities for families to connect. So, almost two years ago, Beth decided to create a nonprofit called City of Support, which stands for Children in Therapy and You. Its mission is to further develop a supportive and dynamic online and in-person community for these families. One of the first initiatives that City of Support chose to pursue was fundraising for was to help fund special collections of therapeutic books, materials, tools, and toys at local libraries for families to access these resources for free. I am very excited to share that my library is the first recipient of a $10,000 donation from City of Support to build such a collection. <laughs> it is really exciting. 
There are so many opportunities for libraries to be the Village Center, but that also requires the support from within the library community as well, from administrators and boards of trustees and managers and coworkers. I am fortunate that I have received overwhelming support from the Arlington Heights Memorial Library and want to express my gratitude for all the staff that I've worked with there. Thanks also for allowing me to dress up as a unicorn to lead epic dance parties. I can genuinely say I have the best job ever. Um, thank you to the community of Arlington Heights for being such great supporters of the library. I'd also like to thank my family for their love and encouragement and to my daughters, um, Sophia and Eliana, for lending me your unicorn costumes. Thank you again. At San Francisco Public Library, Janet Tan has created a unique and innovative programming to meet her community needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her Death and Dying program series features doctors, religious fi figures, artists, and others to share key information about end of life issues, serving to dispel the deep seated taboo around discussing mortality. She has also helped coordinate the San Francisco Chinese Alzheimer's Association's annual bilingual forum, in which medical experts share resources for patients and their families. In the words of her nominators, by bringing individuals, professionals, and outside groups into the library for panels and programs, she widens the community network of friendships and collaboration for lifelong learning. Congratulations, Janet. Good afternoon. I'm honored to receive the I Love My Librarian Award, and thanks to the selection committee, and congratulations to my fellow award winners. Thank you also to my nominators, people who came to my programs, past and present, and most recently to my Death and Dying series. One of the reasons I became a librarian is because I love helping people find what they need. I also love researching things that interest me. Do you ever have those quirky questions that you've always wanted to know the answers to? I did. For example, I've always wanted to know what happens to bodies, my body, when I die. What happens to our bodies when we die? If I donated it to science, what would they do with it? Can you compost it? Then I wondered, would anyone else be interested in knowing about this? What started as one question morphed into eight programs covering everything from my initial question to how different faith traditions view death, California's End of Life Options Act, words people say as they're dying, and most importantly, how to get people to talk about what they want to happen to them when they die. The trick is they have to do it while they're alive. I discovered a new world of information and found experts in the field who are not only willing, but wanting to speak to the public about the work they do and why it's so important to learn about it and talk about it now. I want to share my award with the 33 remarkable people who came to speak in my programs, people who show compassion, care, and love every day to the people they serve at what may be one of the toughest times in their lives. And thanks to the hundreds of people who came to the library, some to every program, to hear information they have been wanting to know more about. The library was the perfect place to hold these programs. I like to see our libraries as community centers, community living rooms, if you will, places where anyone can come to learn, exchange ideas, and talk about things they're concerned about in a safe, comfortable, and welcoming space. At this time, I'd also like to thank some very special people. When they heard this idea, they didn't say, are you kidding? Why would you want to do a program like that? But rather, they said, that's a great idea, and I will help you make it happen. Thank you, Jim Van Buskirk, Nate Hinderman, Dr. Don Gross, and Michael Pappas, among others, for making death and dying a topic we can talk about in the open. I think all of us who work in libraries do it because we love what we do. And the I Love My Librarian Award gives the people we serve in the community a chance to tell us they love us too. Congratulations to each and every one of the 1,974 librarians who are nominated by the people they love. It's the best kind of acknowledgement to know that we are appreciated and loved for what we do. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you once again for giving me the opportunity and the honor to introduce, to recognize, and to celebrate these, these three amazing public librarians. Please join me in giving them another hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you all for participating in this very special event. Please join me in a final round of applause for this year's I Love My Librarian Award winners. Thank you again. Let us continue the celebration as we head to their reception. All are welcome to join. <laughs>